All right. It says I'm live. It says that I'm here. I believe I am. But you got to let me know if that's actually the case. Welcome to another Monday night. I really appreciate all of you being here. And we have a lot to talk about when it comes to one of our greatest adversaries, stockpiling literally everything. And of course, um, preppers do some of that stuff too. And if a major nuclear superpower is doing it, maybe you should ask yourself if it's something that would be a good idea to do as well. Thank you all for being here. We got five by something coming in from Grissio Nemo, which is always a good sign. I miss when MP looked like a male rogue. Well, I still do, I promise. I just have a hat on because I've been wearing it all day. We got five by five six coming in from Cops Help Americans, 308 by Chocolate Chip Cookies from Jet. Everyone here speaks my language, apparently. Gemini, X Gemini, or Gen X Gemini, whatever, you know, or it's whatever any, anymore. Five by five, we got the FJB coming in from Oath Taker 276. Tango down 89, five by five. Wooder Dude says 17 by 76. I think we're good to go. I do want to mention Midway USA is the biggest supporter of the channel. Thanks to them, I can get live streams like this one put together and also find myself better prepared thereafter. So a big thanks to Midway USA for always supporting the channel. And uh, David Bies is saying he's a boomer and he's here. And you know what? We appreciate that you're here. So thank you so much. Um, I hit the thumb, no Garan, says Majestic Lion. Well, a thumbs up would always be appreciated. And I like to kind of let everyone get into the chat and get into the stream so we can get things moving. I also want to say thank you so much to everyone here on Replay Crew. If you are here, you know, tomorrow or the next day or whenever you come back around, I really appreciate you being here. It's very helpful. And um, tonight, we, like I said last week, we're trying some new settings. So there should not be any ads. <laughs> That's the best I got. There should not be. If there are, there are, because there literally should not be, and that's all I can do at this point in time. There's no other options, unfortunately. Now, what are we up to here? Well, we're going to talk about why China is stockpiling literally everything. And it should concern you because, in all honesty, why are they doing it? I mean, what feasible reason could you possibly conceive of that would require China to be stockpiling lots of different types of resources. And I think the answer is relatively obvious. But talking about everything they're doing, which everything we're talking about tonight was within like the last 10 days. So this should tell you that they're ramping up for a certain event that they expect to have happen here in the near future. But it also goes to show you what other countries might be looking to do here and what also you could watch out for when it comes to some of these, I guess you would say catalytic style events all right so let's go ahead uh slime hollow 13 says star wars clone army order 66 well to be fair the jedi were getting a little power hungry and out of hand let's be honest i mean there was really no one there to stand up against them right so i i still don't know how i feel about the whole thing but you know anakin might have gone a little far i'm not really a big fan of uh what he did but everything else i you know it's hard to say let's get going okay first off Let's talk about a neighbor of China and just kind of set some uh, context for what we're going to discuss tonight and kind of give you an idea as to why this might be happening. All right, so we have Aukus, A-U-K-U-S, weighs Japan's participation in defense tech development. Okay, this is from March 2nd, so two days ago, and this is from Nikkei Asia. Ahead of Prime Minister Kishida's visit in April, U.S. leads talks with U.K. and Australia. Washington, the U.S. has begun talks with the U.K. and Australia on inviting Japan to collaborate on defense technology under the Accus Security Partnership, American officials told Nikkei Asia, aiming to make an announcement during the J Japanese leader's visit to the White House next month. Washington is leading discussions with London and Canberra in hopes of extending an invitation to Tokyo at a summit between President Joe Biden and Prime Minister Fumio Kishida on April 10th, the official said. Japan will be the first country invited to work in the trilateral AUKUS framework since it was launched in September of 2021. While the so-called Pillar 1 goal for AUKUS centers on helping Australia acquire conventionally armed nuclear-powered submarines, its Pillar 2 goal focuses on developing advanced warfighting capabilities such as artificial intelligence, undersea drones, hypersonic and electronic warfare technologies. According to the officials, the collaboration with Japan would be limited to a specific project on developing cutting-edge defense technologies under Pillar 2. The three countries do not intend to give full-fledged membership to Japan or have Tokyo contribute to submarine development. Now, like it was stated in this report, this is the first time that this has happened since these exercises began in September of 2021. So you might want to ask yourself, you know, why is this happening now? Is involving Japan 
what we need to do based on the security threat there by China in that region, I think that would be a pretty obvious yes for us to all say it. We can all say it together, actually. Say yes. Thanks. Now, we also, Orcus is how it's pronounced. Orcus. I don't know. I'm just going to say Alcus. I, I like phonetics. That's how I like to roll. <laughs> All right. So we had that happen. And then we also have Japan talking about the danger that's really nearby. And this kind of just builds that context for the conversation we're having tonight. All right. So this is from The Diplomat. And uh, this is from today. Danger and deterrence of Japan's security environment. We must handle the hypothesis of an imminent threat as long as nuclear weapons exist. So Japan looks at China as being an imminent threat, which is understandable, especially because of their close ties with North Korea. But let's move forward here. As Hamada Yasukazu, former Minister of Defense of Japan, explained in the document Defense of Japan 2022, the world is at a moment of historic change. The international community is facing its greatest challenge since the Second World War. So Japan gets it when it comes to where we are right now in the terms of history, right? Japan understands what the world is devolving into. Our media still hasn't quite uh, came around to the idea yet, but I understand what this person is saying. The international community is facing its greatest challenge since the Second World War. For Japan, the regional context could not be more complicated. Russia's invasion of Ukrainian territory marked a new era of crisis, given that the country is a permanent member of the UN Security Council, yet it did not consider international law and even threatened to use nuclear weapons. Likewise, China is dramatically increasing its military capabilities, both quantitatively and qualitatively, including missiles and nuclear weapons, while continuing to pursue unilateral changes in the status quo in the East China Sea and South China Sea. Additionally, North Korea is rapidly advancing its missile and nuclear nuclear weapons development. In addition to destabilizing the Korean Peninsula, Pyongyang has repeatedly launched missiles over Japanese territory in recent years. To strengthen its defense system, Japan has been making an extraordinary investment, setting itself the goal in December last year of spending 43 trillion yen or 302 billion US dollars in the period 2023 to 2027. For this reason, Japan has also deepened its military cooperation with the United States, its only ally. Today, there are 120 US military military bases on Japanese territory, housing a total of 57,000 U.S. troops, 70% of which are in Okinawa. Okay, so Japan's getting ready. We're inviting Japan to defense technology summits. And why might that be? Well, I think China's starting to give us some red flags. And when I say that, what I mean is that, well, just like the title of tonight's live stream says, they're stockpiling everything. And what does a nation do before it enters into open war. It, it brings its reserves up to a reasonable level because they're not sure what's going to be disrupted. And I think that, well, as preppers, we could definitely learn a lesson from that because if war is on the horizon, what's the best thing you can do? Well, stock up for it, right? Nick, I appreciate it. Are pitcher style water filters good for SHTF? Um, I mean, I think they're better than not filtering your water at all. There are some uh, specifically like Seychelle has a pitcher style water filter that also filters out, you know, radioactive uh, contaminants and stuff like that. So um, do your research, but there are some that are a little bit above and beyond what you would get in like a Brita filter that you would go find at your local big box store. But yeah, they have their application for sure. They're just generally, you know, more fragile. They don't use or have the ability to filter as much water before changing the filter. And there's also uh, the fact that they don't hold a lot of water. So, you know, it's a compromise, but they definitely have some benefits 100%. Uh, okay, so uh, Cherokee Survival, good to see you. Don't worry about being late. We will forgive you, I promise. All right, You're, you just made it. We're now finally starting on China after we built some context around the fact that Japan is getting antsy. All right, they're getting a little anxious over there. Why is that? Well, it's because China's getting ready for war. And they, we know Japan will be involved because, well, like they just told us, Japan is our ally and we are their only ally. And they are very strategically located right off the coast of China. So let's go ahead and talk about what China's stockpiling. And this will give you some, I don't know, context as to how quickly things might develop in that region. All right. And if you're new here, 
Thank you so much for being here. These are the conversations we try to have on a, on a weekly basis. I always have to drink some coffee in order to get through because I talk relatively quickly and it's not necessarily on purpose, but I'm just kind of wired that way. Um, and if you're new and you like it, make sure you hit the subscribe button because uh, I would like you to come back so we can have more conversations, all right? So let's go. First off, this is from AgWeb, okay? Now, this was reported two days ago on March 2nd. China's Biden and sorghum are surging right now, but why? I don't know. Let's find out or at least uh, speculate as to why. China continues to ramp up its purchases of feed grain around the globe with even more expected in the coming weeks. Actually, this story is from today. I was actually talking about the photo that was or the video that was placed there. So this story is actually from today. OK, on Monday, Bloomberg reported China has purchased more than 20 cargoes of feed grain in just the past two weeks, which totals 1.2 million tons of grain. From corn to sorghum to even barley, China continues to buy feed grains. Last week, trade sources said China was pricing corn out of the PNW. However, no daily sales have been confirmed. Then this week, trade sources report China has purchased 10 cargoes from Ukraine. No matter the source of the surge in purchases, one thing is clear. China is stockpiling grain. They're buying a little corn, but they're mostly buying from Ukraine and buying from Brazil right now, says Arlen Suderman, chief commodities economist for Stonex Group. When you look at where U.S. corn is priced, it's about 25 to 30 cents higher price than Brazil corn. But Brazil is starting to switch towards soybeans, so that's good news for the U.S. Suderman points out since China is buying from Ukraine, despite the growing risk in the Red Sea, he also points out Stone X Group estimates China just harvested a large crop. So it's not like they're buying due to lack of grain or feed. Oh, I wonder why. They're buying a lot of Ukraine corn. The key there is the Red Sea, because all of that corn coming to Ukraine goes through the Red Sea or all the way around the southern end of Africa. And so that increases the costs. It's ironic that China is buying that corn because they just had a bumper crop based on our private sources in China. And our people there, we believe the crop, yeah, I, that's a weird sentence, in China was bigger than even the government says that it was. Why would they be lying about all these crops that they're producing and then also buying additional crops? Suderman says that begs the question, why is China even buying all this grain? He says it's to build up their reserves, which he says is taking place for nearly every major commodity, including corn, soybeans, and even crude oil. They are buying corn from their farmers, putting it in reserves to try to prop up the price, and by propping up the price, they're making it the arbitrage of work for importing corn. So they're continuing to do that they're buying grain sorghum for feed as well. They're buying up commodities, building up reserves, Suderman says. What about Taiwan? Chip Flory, who is host of AgriTalk, but also the Farm Journal Economist, says the fact that China is buying so many different commodities also sparks another question. What is China preparing for? When they shift gears and start to accelerate their purchasing, you have to ask the question, why? Why are they doing it? So if they are accumulating all these commodities, the list that Arlen went through, what are they prepping for? Is Taiwan involved in this? It could be something that we're going to have to watch very closely, says Flory. So, and just to kind of put it out there, when you're reading through articles like this and you're reading stories like this, okay, don't just take this story at face value. Like this story just told us, well, they're buying soybeans, they're buying grain, they're buying crude oil. What are they doing? Why are they prepping, right? So what led to the conversation we're having tonight is then what I like to do and what I suggest you do as well is to then take the additional step and say, well, where are they getting this information or is there any additional information surrounding those other categories? And of course, there is. So we're going to talk about those tonight, but I just want to mention that so that it gives you some idea of uh, how to navigate some of this information when you're consuming it, okay? So according to Blue Reef Agri-Marketing's Chip Nellinger, the recent sell-off in the soybean market was partially tied to the lack of soybean sales to China. It wasn't that they weren't buying beans. They're buying in record amounts of South American beans, so their appetite is as strong or stronger than it ever has been, says Nellinger. It's just right now, in the short run, they're not buying beans from us, okay? So China's clearly stocking up on grain. And what do you need grain for? We all know you have you need grain to feed the populace, whether or not you're using it to directly feed the people or you're using it as feed for livestock or whatever you need it for. It's something you will need, especially if you have to import a large amount of the resources that you're currently using. So that's the first thing that they are stockpiling. When I refer to everything, that's the one that I thought was a good way to lead into this conversation because, you know, food is how you control the populace. You cannot keep control if people are starving falls apart pretty quickly. So let's see here. Billy the Kid Norwood, China built our railroads. <laughs> well, I mean, 
a lot of things have changed since then. But yes, there's a lot of uh, evidence of that, of course. Warrior for Christ, just ordered my first PSA 10.5 AR-15. Excited to upgrade it. Well, good for you. I'm glad you did that. I don't know how experienced you are with ARs or anything like that, but that being a 10.5, do everyone a favor and please put a flash hider on it or preferably a suppressor, but do not put a muzzle brake on it, please. It might seem like something you want to do because maybe you're just trying to tr test things out, but for everyone else around you, I'm trying to do them a favor. Flash hider or suppressor, no muzzle brakes, please, okay? <laughs> everyone else who knows will know. Anyway, yeah, WM said put a loudener on it. <laughs> Let's move forward. What else is China stockpiling? Well, I mean, or how about this? What else is China attempting to stockpile? Because sometimes you got to put the pieces into place. You can't just expect to be able to purchase everything you want at the amounts that you need. All right. So this is from, well, hold on one second here. It's uh, South China, but anyway. China demands drug suppliers boost imports to combat rise in winter respiratory diseases. Now, this was published on February 23rd. But this still tells you what it is they're attempting to accomplish, okay? Doctors complain of a drug shortage amid a spike in infectious diseases caused by multiple pathogens. Azithromycin is among the treatments in short supply as being much sought after and subject to overuse and misuse in China. Now, just so everyone's aware, keep this in mind. Azithromycin was recently replacing amoxicillin when it came to prescriptions here in the U.S. because of an amoxicillin shortage. Now, China is dealing with a problem getting enough azithromycin. So... Who knows if that's going to spill over here as well, but it's just always a good idea to keep these things in mind, okay? China's National Healthcare Security Administration has demanded suppliers resolve a shortage of imported drugs, because they're imported, that are widely used to treat respiratory diseases and influenza following complaints by doctors. A report posted on state council website gov.cn said the rise of seasonal infectious diseases had rapidly pushed up demand for imported drugs, including azithromycin for injection and antibiotic used to treat a range of infections. Azithromycin is included on China's national reimbursement drug list, which lists government-selected drugs eligible for full or partial reimbursement every year. Although most are domestic medicines, some imported pharmaceuticals such as azithromycin injections are also on the list okay these drugs are bought by the government via designated companies by buying in bulk the government can lower the price of drugs on the nrdl china has seen a spike in respiratory diseases caused by multiple pathogens since the middle of the last year azithromycin was much sought after during a surge in mycoplasma pneumoniae among children last year Okay. During the spikes last year, many hospitals were overwhelmed by patients and internet users scrambled for the antibiotics to treat their children despite warnings from doctors that the drug should only be used under prescription. Okay, now, understand, China's very good at the manipulation game, right? So if they wanted to start stockpiling drugs, but they had to have a reason for why in order to convince these suppliers and to convince these distributors that they needed this additional medication they otherwise might not have access to it wouldn't be hard for them to develop data that would support the fact that they need all this stuff in in order to acquire it right so keep that in mind as we go through china's not just going to try one way or the other right the nhsa said it had summoned suppliers for talks and warnings following complaints by doctors of a drug shortage the administration manages china's government-backed healthcare insurance schemes it said it would step up inspections to ensure suppliers distributed the drugs on time and would encourage healthcare institutes to report any shortage or delayed delivery of azithromycin injections or other drugs on the NRDL to treat respiratory diseases. Healthcare institutes could use drugs on the reserve drug list or substitutes in the event of a shortage the administration set. So just keep this in mind. China is demanding drug suppliers boost their imports. What would you need a lot of antibiotics for? I mean, there's, I can think of a few things. Okay, so... WN, which medication service is sponsoring MP? That would be Jace Medical, actually. So um, if you're into that, um, if you want to get prescription drugs uh, delivered right to you via a legitimate prescription, right? This is not a scam or anything like that. Um, then Jace Medical can help you out. And I think, uh, I think I have a link here. Here we go. I'll give you guys a link real quick here in the chat if you are interested because I have the Jace case. I think it's highly valuable. And uh, having additional 
antibiotics on hand is a good idea. I mean, let's be honest. We all know the deal there. Um, so I just put it in the live chat in case, um, in case that's something you're interested in. Okay. Um, let's see. It is not getting any warmer here. SFDCL. We got a lot of snow yesterday, like a ton, but whatever, you know what? It was worth it. And I got out and I got to do some uh, shooting in it and some training and wearing some gear and testing things out. And man, those Swiss mill syrup gators really do work. Like they are excellent. My feet were bone dry. Okay. So what else is going on? Well, here's something you might not have been aware of. Okay. China um, has been, okay. This is going to sound funny before I show you this screen. Would it be a good idea if your adversary was <laughs> buying something you were stockpiling in order to help their stockpile? And in the process, you were depleting your stockpile so they could buy stuff for their stockpile. Do you think that would be a good strategy? Because if you didn't know, that's exactly what was happening. So let's talk about that, all right? Okay, the U.S. might bar sales to China from its strategic oil reserve. This is from 13 hours ago. Did you know that we sell oil to China from the strategic petroleum reserve, right? Um, you know, we, we released millions of barrels in order to help correct the prices of oil. And, of course, the way that works is that you sell it, right? And so we depleted our strategic reserves. China bought it because it was cheap at the time. And guess where they put theirs? in their strategic reserves. I don't see how this could be a bad thing at all. In fact, there's no degradation here at all, okay? Um, let's see here. Aries God says, which is what I, I assume is how that's said, will you ever make a video on wargaming for SHTF? Well, you know what? That's all dependent on whether or not I feel comfortable or capable of doing so, right? I'm not an expert in a lot of that type of um, strategy, I guess, when it comes to feeling confident enough to tell other people about it, right? I want to make sure that you're getting good information. And if I'm not um, capable of something or if I'm not well versed in it, then I don't necessarily want to share it um, unless it gives you a learning experience that I endure. So when it comes to a lot of like my equipment failures, I share those because it tells everyone else what could possibly happen to them as well, even though I might not be like an engineer or anything along those lines, right? So, um, but I'll keep that in mind and I appreciate the uh, heads up there. Um, Hunter Moon, hello to you. Glad you're here. Thanks for saying hi. Water Tiger, I see you and I appreciate you being here. KP Heathen, greetings from Louisiana. Well, greetings from North Dakota. And at the same time, uh, I miss Louisiana. We we actually, uh, uh, we were out to eat recently and the kids wanted to try frog legs and I said, go for it. And they actually did, they enjoyed them. And you know what? I was like, man, this reminds me of swamp food. And you know what? I like swamp food. <laughs> I grew up in Florida, though, so whatever. Let's keep going, all right? So a new government funding bill includes a measure that would prohibit China from buying oil from the U.S. Strategic Petroleum Reserve. The provision was included in legislation unveiled by congressional leaders Sunday as lawmakers work to avert a government shutdown. The Strategic Petroleum Reserve is an emergency oil stash set up following the 1973 oil crisis. The White House in 2022 announced a record release of 180 million barrels of oil, with 10% for the big guy, from the SPR in an attempt to rein in energy prices following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Hey, Prepper Now, glad you're here. I appreciate you modding and appreciate you being here. The idea was to buy back oil at lower prices to refill the SPR with the dual effect of also spurring domestic oil production. The bet paid off handsomely. By selling high and buying low, the Biden administration's oil trade netted a $66 million profit. Now, by the way, this is all being said in such a positive way, but I also remember certain pipelines being canceled and other energy investments being stalled from the same people who are part of this strategy so uh, yeah well okay yeah they want to invest in domestic production but then they stop it from happening i don't know anyway among the companies that purchased oil from the spr during the 2022 drawdown was unipec america the texas based armed based arm of chinese state-owned oil giant senepec bought 1 million barrels from the reserve it was not the first time the SPR had sold oil to a Chinese firm. The Trump administration in 2017 sold some stockpiled oil to a subsidiary of state-owned PetroChina, right? Also a bad idea. 
Critics say sales from the SPR should not benefit China, which the White House views as the nation's most serious competitor. In January 2023, the House passed a bill with language similar to the provision unveiled Sunday barring SPR sales to Chinese government entities. That bill was not taken up by the Senate. At the time, the Chinese state-owned tabloid Global Times denounced the bill as a move to smear and blacken China. Okay. Now here's the part that you should also be aware of. China has its own SPR too. Whether limiting sales to China from America's SPR, by the way, SPR is Strategic Petroleum Reserve, okay? We're not talking about special purpose rifles here, people. I, I know how your brains work. I, we're, all, we're all cool here. I get it. Uh, but we're talking about oil right now. While limiting sales to China from America's SPR would meaningfully change the energy security calculus for either country is unclear. Of all oil sold from the SPR between 2017 and February of 2023, only 2.5% went to Chinese firms, while 63% of sale volumes went to U.S. firms, according to Congressional Research Service. For its part, China has been building up its own strategic petroleum reserves with what appear to be well-timed entries into the market to scoop up cheap oil. Calculations by investor and researcher Alex Turnbull show that China's stockpile of crude oil has more than doubled since 2020. Huh, that's weird. Ours has hit all-time lows since then, but what do I know? I just need more coffee. I get some dry mouth throughout these conversations. Okay, China clearly built this stockpile very aggressively in 2020 when prices were low. I actually remember a time when they were negative. But what do I know? Backed off imports when prices were high in early mid-2022, also when China was in some state of lockdown. Opportunistically bought more in quarter two 2023 and now seems to be backing off very quickly, Turnbull wrote in October in his new letter, newsletter, Syncretica. Okay. China buys plenty of U.S. liquefied natural gas through long-term contracts with major suppliers, as well as purchases on the spot market. But Beijing is reportedly discouraging state-owned energy majors from signing more LNG deals in the U.S. over concerns of mounting geopolitical tensions. Meanwhile, two Democratic senators last week introduced legislation that would indefinitely ban exports of U.S. oil and liquefied natural gas to China. Whether or not that bill gains traction, energy, both renewable and fossil fuel based will be a highly contested domain in US China relations. So, China's stockpiling oil. Some of what they're stockpiling is the oil from our stockpile. Okay, I told you they're stockpiling everything. The, oh, you wanna you wanna talk about more stuff they're stockpiling? Okay, we can do that. I'm into it. Also, uh, let's see here. Scrolling through. Harbor Prepper, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Stockpile coffee, 100%. In case you don't know, instant coffee is not the best tasting, but also the easiest to store long term. It's basically freeze dried coffee, if you want to look at it that way. And um, it lasts pretty much forever. So, freeze dried coffee is your friend if you're like me and you need coffee all the way through SHTF, but you don't want to have to store green beans. Because I don't. I, Who's got time for that? If we're dealing with SHTF, I just want to throw some hot water in a cup with some crystals and call it a day, right? Coffee crystals. Anyway, let's see here. Wuhan bat salad dressing coming soon. <laughs> Joe Cox. You know, sometimes I read those just out of the blue, and it's always like the best thing ever. So I appreciate all of you in the chat always doing the right thing here. So what else is China stockpiling? I mean, this should give you some indicators as well. Okay, this is from Monday, February 26th, so a week ago, all right? China's getting ready for the chip wars next stage by stockpiling. It's like everything we talk about tonight is something to do with them stockpiling. I don't, what, why are they stockpiling everything? All right, many nations prepare for potential wars by hoarding fuel and weaponry. Chinese businesses are frantically hoarding components for chip manufacturing equipment. As a result, Western and Japanese vendors have reaped enormous benefits, but this bodes poorly for the future. Tokyo Electron, a Japanese manufacturer of chip equipment, is the most recent company to reap the benefits of China's surplus. Since it increased its earnings forecast around two weeks ago, its stock has climbed 20%. Sales in China more than doubled from the previous year, and the country accounted for nearly half of its total net sales in the most recent quarter. 
As global semiconductor companies, particularly those making memory chips, reduced their capital expenditure last year, strong demand from China helped to counteract this trend. Custom statistics from China show that the value of semiconductor equipment imported to the nation reached about $40 billion in 2023, an increase of 14% from the previous year. Global sales of semiconductor equipment declined 6.1% year on year in 2023 to $101 billion, according to industry organization Semi. This is a marked improvement from Semi's initial July projection, which predicted a decline of 18.6%. The Chinese government is spending like crazy for a few different reasons. To start, in preparation for stricter export restrictions in the West, Chinese semiconductor producers have been hastily stockpiling equipment. This is especially the case with lithography equipment, which print microcircuits on silicone wafers using light. Along with the United States, Japan, and the Netherlands, who are major exporters of these devices, have also implemented export restrictions to China. Lithography equipment imported to China from the Netherlands nearly doubled in 2023 compared to the previous year, as shown in China's customs data. The world leader in lithography equipment, a Dutch company called ASML, saw a tripling of net system sales to China in 2023, compared to 2022 when China accounted for just 14% of ASML's total net system sales. Last year, it increased to 29%. ASML state-of-the-art extreme ultraviolet lithography equipment has been unavailable to Chinese buyers for some time. It will also be unable to ship some less sophisticated devices there due to newer regulations. Dutch authorities have canceled licenses for selling specific lithography machines to China, according to the company's announcement last month. 10 to 15% of ASML sales to China might be impacted this year, according to the company. Okay, so... Sanctions are making it harder for Chinese companies to produce cutting edge electronics, but they are making great strides in more established technology. Semiconductor Manufacturing International Corporation, SMIC, the biggest contract chip maker in China, has stated that its capital investment for this year will be approximately $7.5 billion, which is almost unchanged from last year. Okay, so they're stockpiling components and they're stockpiling chips. You need all of that technology for military equipment. And they're aware of the fact that there are certain places, especially Taiwan, that if they suddenly didn't have full access to their manufacturing capabilities, it would impact their military readiness, especially when it comes to things that we are seeing used widespread at this point in time, like drones, right? We have underwater unmanned vehicles now. We have all kinds of AI-dependent machinery, which China is also using. I mean, the UK and the US are supplying Ukraine with AI drones at this point in time. Like it's, it's, it's out of control. So China's stockpiling these components because they assume that in a conflict scenario, they will be cut off and no longer have access. And to me, that's problematic because um, why are they assuming that, right? But I mean, it's sensible at the same time. Build a bunker, says Dion Garza. I appreciate that, Dion, and I agree. I agree, and there, I, I have plans, okay? Um, the hardest part of these plans is just being able to pull it all off. So, uh, but I, I have ideas. Don't worry. <laughs> all right. Get you ham radios, boys and girls, says WM. I think they're a great thing to have. I think you also need to, well, let's just say, um, have a variety of different radios as well because you want to have more bandwidths that you can access. So having a CB radio and having, you know, access to GMRS or FRS frequencies or anything else, uh, MERS is a good idea, but also make sure you have proper licensing if you want to be able to use these things legally while the grid is up or while things are good. And then of course, anything is game during an emergency. So keep that in mind. Now, let's go ahead. And what else are they stockpiling? Oh, wait, <laughs> there's more? Yeah, there's more. Let's keep going. Uh, well, this, this stockpile is actually a little kind of concerning, let's be honest, okay? The Economic Times. February 27th is when this article was last updated. China's rapidly expanding nuclear weapons stockpile remains opaque. Without providing the world with any word of explanation, in the past five years, the People's Liberation Army rocket force of China has expanded the types and quantity of its nuclear-tipped weapons more than at any point in its history. Indeed, last month, the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists published its annual in-depth nuclear notebook. 
The chapter entitled Chinese Nuclear Weapons 2024, authored by Hans M. Christensen, Matt Korda, Ileana Johns, and Mackenzie Knight warned, in all, China's nuclear expansion is among the largest and most rapid modernization campaigns of the nine nuclear armed states in the world. The chapter's author stated that in the past year, China has continued to develop its three new missile silo fields for solid fuel intercontinental ballistic missiles, expanded the construction of new silos for its liquid fuel DF-5 ICBMs, has been developing new variants of ICBMs and advanced strategic delivery systems, and has likely produced excess warheads for eventual upload onto these systems once they are deployed. China has also further expanded its dual-capable DF-26 intermediate range ballistic missile force, which appears to have completely replaced the medium-range DF-21 in the nuclear role. For those advocating reductions in nuclear weapons, such figures make grim reading. Apart from land-based truck-launched and silo-launched missiles, the PLA Navy is now carrying JL-3 submarine-launched ballistic missiles on its Type or six Type 094 nuclear-powered ballistic missile submarines. In the air, H-6 bombers of the PLA Air Force have been reassigned to an operational nuclear mission. Plus, there is continued development of an air-launched ballistic missile that likely has a nuclear capability. This capacity will grow even more once a stealthy H-20 bomber is fielded. Chinese military spokesmen have neither confirmed nor denied the expansion of the ICBM force. And the authors of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientist chapter on China acknowledge the opacity of the PLARF. Analyzing and estimating China's nuclear forces is a challenging endeavor, particularly given the relative lack of state originating data and the tight control of messaging surrounding the country's nuclear arsenal and doctrine. Beijing has never officially revealed warhead numbers, and its opacity regarding its nuclear capability is legendary. When asked why Chairman Xi Jinping uh, is prioritizing China's ballistic missile arsenal in such a fashion, Ankit Panda, Stanton Senior Fellow, Nuclear Policy Program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, told ANI there is likely no one, or, oh, no one overarching reason. That was a mouthful. For one, this simply may be part of Xi's broader efforts to pursue a world-class military for the country. China could also have calculated that a larger force is necessary for assuring retaliation, which is a traditional objective. The surge could also be a result of the rocket force gaining greater political power after the 2015 reorganization of the PLA. We simply do not know the exact answer, since China has yet to give us an authoritative case for why the force is growing. Does anyone here have any ideas for why China would be growing its nuclear stockpile and its nuclear capabilities when it comes to developing new intercontinental ballistic missiles and everything else? I mean, I don't know I, if there's anything that you guys think they might be wanting to do in the future. Let me know in the chat because um, everyone's just a little confused, apparently. Admiral Charles Richard, the previous commander of the U.S. Strategic Command, said in April of 2022 that China's expansion of the strategic forces was breathtaking. The force's current commander, General Anthony Cotton, testified vexingly last March that China seeks to match or in some areas surpass quantitative and qualitative parity with the United States in terms of nuclear weapons. China's nuclear capabilities already exceed those needed for its long-professed policy of minimum deterrence, but China's capabilities continue to grow at an alarming rate. It is thus the Pentagon's opinion that massive new missile silo fields and the expansion of China's liquid-fueled ICBM inventory show that Beijing is moving to launch on warning posture to increase the peacetime readiness of its nuclear forces. It believes part of this posture involves implementing an early warning counter-strike strategy, relying Oh, they wanted to fight me right there. Hold on, we're getting back to it. Do, do, do. All right. Implementing an early warning counter-strike strategy, relying on space and ground-based sensors to warn of enemy missile strikes so that China has time to launch its own missiles before they are destroyed. On the other hand, China insists it's keeping the PLARF at a moderate readiness level. Okay, so we're stockpiling... Just as a recap real quick, we're stockpiling grains, food, right? We're stockpiling crude oil supplies, some of which came from our own strategic stockpile. Uh, we're stockpiling microchips. We're stockpiling nuclear weaponry, okay? Um, I, why? Why could they possibly need to stockpile any of these things, right? I don't know. 
I don't know. But I can say that there's a lot of other movement happening via China when it comes to disruption and escalation in the world. And I can also tell you that their defense spending is going up and that there are countries that are starting to catch on to the fact that some of these programs are, let's just call them um, more about infiltration than they are about generating a profit, right? A lot of people think China is just in it for the business, right? But that's assuming a nefarious actor has no malicious intent. It would be better to assume that they do and then find out later that they don't. But I don't think that's necessarily the case. So let's talk about that here. But just as a quick reference, China defense spending to climb 7.2% as Xi pursues a buildup. Okay. Now, this is from uh, Bloomberg. And let's see, I believe this article came out, well, this is 14 minutes ago. I feel like that's a little bit early. <laughs> but anyway, okay. China's defense spending will grow by 7.2% this year, the most in five years. What? Why? An increase that comes amid signs corruption is undermining a military revamp. Huh. Military expenditure by the central government is expected to rise to 1.67 trillion yuan, $231 billion in 2024, according to an annual finance ministry report seen by Bloomberg News on Tuesday as the National People's Congress started in Beijing. In comparison, U.S. President Joe Biden signed an annual $886 billion defense bill late last year, one that advanced a trilateral security deal with Australia and the U.K., largely intended to counter China. Okay. Chinese leader Xi Jinping has set a 2027 deadline for his nation's military to become a world-class force. One of his diplomats say is focused on defense, yet doubts are mounting over whether graft is hindering that ambition. The People's Liberation Army Daily said this year it would continue fighting the difficult and protracted war on graft, a pledge that came after the defense sector was shaken by a series of abrupt personnel changes. And if you don't know, uh, apparently the Chinese military is dealing with a lot of internal corruption. Seems like on par with everything you would assume from the PLA. But the other thing to keep in mind is that, um, I mean, subversion is, uh, is a tactic. So who knows what's really happening, but that's just what we're being told. Uh, but this just goes to show you that they are raising their defense spending, okay? Why? Well, I think we all know why. Now, let's talk about things that are happening in other parts of the world regarding Chinese military actions and things that you might not be aware that are happening you know, right now uh, that people need to really consider when it comes to not only national security, but personal security too, and what you can or cannot rely on come SHTF, right? Especially when it comes to Chinese components. China's very corrupt, says Prepper now. Exactly. There's a lot going on there. To Baby Car, what up? Good to see you. JPAS or JPAS. Hey, Oki Khan, he says. I also say, hey, Oki Khan. Uh, so there we go. All right. David Frost, the government is my only friend. Well, you're a very lonely person then, David. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm very sorry for you. Okay. Check this out. Did you even know this was a thing? Well, let's talk about it. My Chinese drone ban is a big win for US national security, but CCP tech still poses major threats. This is from February 28th from Fox News. After leading the fight for years to ban the federal government from buying Chinese made drones, my American Security Drone Act finally passed and was recently signed into law. First off, did you know the federal government was buying Chinese drones? And when they say federal government, I mean, is that the Department of Defense? Is that the FBI? Is that for domestic use? Who? I, I don't know. Either way, they're using Chinese drones. They've, they've had them for a while. This is a huge win in our fight against communist China because this bipartisan bill, which was co-led by Senator Mark Warner, Democrat Virginia, and led by Representatives Mike Gallagher, Republican Wisconsin, and Joe Courtney, Democrat Connecticut, in the House, stops a major method of exploitation used by communist China and other evil regimes that want to hurt Americans and spy on our military, families, and businesses. Communist China's commitment to spying on America was on full display last year as we watched its spy balloon soar across the United States. Well, that balloon made a lot of headlines as worried Americans felt the tensions of a possible threat to the homeland for the first time in several decades. My drone bill met resistance in Congress. Thank goodness it passed. You have to think of every drone made in communist China just like that balloon. 
Each one has the ability to gather data or carry harmful payloads across America's military installations and target our critical infrastructure, natural resources, businesses, and families. And I personally own a Chinese-made drone. I, I mean, it just, what other drone can you buy, right? Um, you can buy drones made in the USA, but as when I was talking to American Outlaw here on the channel a while back, um, it's gonna cost you 10, 15 grand, right? because it's gonna have all the capabilities, but it's also gonna be made in America. So to get a baby drone, that is just for surveillance or for looking at things on your property or I don't know, just having fun with, it's probably gonna come from China. And like personally, I bought a Potenzik Atom SE, which I've been testing and, and, and messing around with to try to figure out if something that's that inexpensive has reasonable capabilities for emergencies. But um, thinking about this type of uh, event going on, there could be situations where you wouldn't want to use a drone like that based on what the threat might be, right? So, okay, big storm comes through and your neighbors might be buried or something in the rubble and you're using your drone to try to kind of explore and maybe, you know, locate somebody. Well, I'm not too worried about the fact that the drone's made in China at that point in time. But um, full on SHTF happens where we go to war with China over Taiwan and then China starts doing infrastructure and cyber attacks here in the US. And now I'm wondering if I really want to throw that Chinese made drone up in the air that could easily, I don't know, report back. Who knows? So these are just things you need to keep in mind. And our government's been buying Chinese drones. Okay. We all need to accept that communist China wants to destroy the American way of life. Really? Because it's like some of these politicians you think would be in their, in their wallet, basically, right? But um, apparently uh, some people get it. I don't know. Everything that comes from communist China is a threat to our freedoms and security. This is especially true for technology. Chinese technology is used to elevate the standing of the Chinese Communist Party through manipulation and data theft with the ultimate goal of obtaining leverage over U.S. infrastructure and critical resources to weaken and dominate us and replace America as the world's largest economy. That is Xi's dream, and he will do whatever it takes to make it a reality. For years, Xi was making progress toward accomplishing this goal thanks to the prolific reliance on his fleet of communist Chinese drones that the U.S. has widely adopted from our local law enforcement agencies to the Department of the Interior and backyard hobbyists like myself. The new law changes this and sets us on a course to undo the damage done by communist China gobbling up over 80 percent of a critically important global industry. China's flagship drone company, DJI, has received a lot of attention and documented CCP government subsidies, which makes sense given that DJI commands more than 70% of the world's commercial drone market. But they are just one of many companies the communist regime relies on to maintain control of the global drone market. And like I said, the one I have is a Potenzik, which I'm sure is in the exact same category. Other Chinese drone makers like Autel, Hygrate, and Ehang are critical for Communist China to achieve the CCP's military civil fusion strategy, where the government increasingly and intentionally blurs the lines between commercial and military use for technology and resources in an integrated industrial strategy. This is why my bill was necessary. Drones are part of our everyday lives. They provide critical public safety information, monitor traffic patterns and the weather, fight wildfires, assist emergency responders, inspect bridges and ports, survey land and resources, and much more. It is important that the federal government set the standard on what drones are safe and free of security risks for our communities and not prop up Chinese companies by ceasing to buy Beijing's drones. Playing company whack-a-mole with tens of thousands of companies that are a part of the Chinese drone industry is completely unfeasible for the U.S. government. Stopping our procurement of these drones across the board is much more efficient, and we took a huge step toward that when the American Security Drone Act became law. We also prohibited the federal government from operating these drones and stopped the use of federal grants to buy them to make sure we are doing as much as possible to eliminate the threat. Okay. I am proud to have led the fight against Chinese drones, and while this is an important victory, there is much more work to do. The threats of tech from communist China, like TikTok and advanced artificial intelligence, are only growing, and we know that special interest backing Chinese-made drones and other technologies will continue to throw up roadblocks to banning these unsafe devices at the local, state, and federal level. Okay? We must use this momentum to continue removing CCP-backed products from infiltrating American life, spying on our critical infrastructure, and stealing our data and helping communist China weaken U.S. freedom and security at home and abroad. Okay? So, understand that 
this is a threat, okay? This is a big deal, okay? Now, I, like I have one of these drones, right? I'm sure many of you do too. They're the ones that are affordable, that most people can afford. And they are very useful and they're very um, intuitive and pretty easy to use in all honesty. Um, but they could be used against you. And that's something that American Outlaw said here on the channel. He specifically said, look, you know, I know you guys like these drones and they're good to have and it's a good thing to practice on and to be fine in like a localized emergency, right? Um, a kid goes missing. Yeah, bust out your DJI and fly out into the woods. And if you have some thermal on there, you might find the kid, right? That's, that's, that's a win for everybody. Um, but in a war, especially with China, it's, it's like playing roulette, right? So we're lucky that we have these things take, being taken care of finally, okay? But um, I just, I, I mean, the federal government's been using them. So I don't know what else to say here, you know? Anyway, what else has been going on with China? Because <laughs> a lot. And let's see here. Uh, looks like Rip Curl Readiness is here. Thanks for being here. Thank you for modding and always being an awesome part of the community. Uh, Henry Keller, they use plenty of Chinese-made drones in Ukraine. They sure do. Uh, WM says DJI is awesome, right? It's like, like I said, you can't get a non-Chinese made drone for as inexpensive as you can buy them for. I mean, it's just, it's just reality. Um, I think they're a good thing to have. I think there are definitely applications where they could come in handy, right? And I'm going to be working on a video about my particular drone because it's under the 250 gram weight limit. So it doesn't require like licensing or, or all this stuff. Um, and it definitely has a lot of capability for how inexpensive it is. Um, and I could see it being useful in an emergency, but I don't think I would integrate it into like a Minuteman kit per se um, for surveillance or for recon when your enemy might be at, at the very least affiliated with the CCP, right? So people are constantly worried about communications, right? And encryption and not allowing people to listen into their conversations and being worried about code breaking and whatnot, right? So they don't want to use certain types of radios or they don't want to use certain frequencies because they're so easy to uh, break. But, but then when it comes to like these drones, like that's even a whole nother level of security concern. And, um, yeah, I think that that you would you need to at least have a reasonable expectation of what you would use these devices for and when they would no longer be reasonable to deploy, right? Especially based on like what's happening. So I just keep that in mind. Keep that in mind, okay? Uh yeah, Billy, the kid, yeah, one like I have is a little bit too light to um operate in high winds, although it is still rated up for um I think it's rated to 5 for wind which isn't too bad in all honesty, but um, either way, it has value for what it is. It's questionable for when you would want to not use it though, okay? Now, check this out, because this is also what China's doing, and this is starting to hit other nations at this point, okay? So this is a story from yesterday. India halts Pakistan-bound ship from China suspected of carrying nuclear cargo. Really? Indian security agencies have intercepted a Pakistan-bound ship from China at Mumbai's Nahava Shevra port. The ship, CMA CGM Attila, was suspected to be carrying a dual-use consignment that could be used by Islamabad in its nuclear and ballistics missile program. The co consignment included a computer numerical control machine by an Italian company, which was inspected by customs officials and the Defense Research and Development Organization. The DRDO certified that the CNC machine could be used in manufacturing critical parts for Pakistan's missile development program. The consignment, weighing 22,180 kilograms, was shipped by Taiyun Mining Import and Export Company Limited and was meant for Cosmos Engineering in Pakistan. The consignment was seized under the prevention of possible proliferation by Pakistan and China. The port officials had alerted Indian defense authorities who inspected the heavy cargo and reported their suspicions. The consignment was seized, highlighting concerns that Pakistan might be using China as a conduit to acquire restricted items from Europe and the U.S., masking identities to evade detection. CNC machines are controlled by a computer and offer efficiency, consistency, and accuracy not possible manually. Yada, yada, yada. You guys should all know what CNC machines are by now. Let's be honest, okay? 
This is not the first instance of Indian port officials seizing dual-use military-grade items being shipped from China to Pakistan. In February 2020, China was supplying an autoclave to Pakistan under the cover of an industrial dryer. Cosmos Engineering, a Pakistani defense supplier, has been on a watch list since March 12, 2022, when Indian authorities intercepted a shipment of Italian-made thermoelectric instruments at the Nahava Shiva port. Okay. In June of 2023, U.S. Bureau of Industry and Security sanctioned three Chinese companies for their involvement in supplying missile-applicable items to Pakistan's ballistic missile program. The companies sanctioned were General Technology Limited, Beijing Lulu Technology Development, and Changzhou Utech Composite Company. Okay, So here's the thing. They are more than willing to supply these other nations with capabilities, right? And you have to keep in mind, China is kind of in a perpetual soft conflict with India when it comes to their border dispute. And Pakistan and India are both nuclear countries. So there's long been a consideration that World War III in the sense of like a nuclear war could actually come from India and Pakistan. There's a lot of tension there. And those countries have the capabilities to move forward in that degree. So it's worth keeping an eye on, but with China instigating the situation and supplying the necessary components for ramping up that production, um, it should tell you something because that's what China does. And I'm showing you this not because I'm worried about what's going to happen with India and Pakistan so much as I'm showing you it because they're doing it here too. They're doing it to our adversaries as well. They're doing it everywhere anywhere they can create disruption or chaos which by the way you can then capitalize on they're going to do these types of things so if they're shipping the necessary components to develop nuclear and ballistic missiles to places like pakistan don't assume for a second they aren't shipping the same type of stuff to anywhere else in the world where it might create the same level of disruption and chaos and could you imagine if they were shipping weapons of that level to places like Mexico, where the drug cartels could easily house these weapons of mass destruction and probably easily house, I don't know, a development center with engineers provided by China in order to develop weapons of this nature? I don't know. Um, but I do know it'd be a lot easier to just make weapons right on the border rather than having to launch them all the way across an ocean or the Arctic, right? Anyway... Let's see here. Viv B, lots of vans, lots of rivers. I don't know what we're talking about, but I appreciate all the sentiment there. <laughs> all right. And uh, Peter Birdsall, tech is overrated. Yes, but it is also very useful. And I, someone with a drone can probably find me faster than you can on your feet. And that's just reality. So plus, if I you know, have to engage the drone, well, that's much better for the drone user than the person that I can see that I have to engage, right? So like, like, just keep that in mind. Leverage technology for what it does. Don't be a Luddite just because it's not necessary, right? Use it to, to your benefit. Leverage what you can these days. In general, in your life, leverage whatever's available to you. Don't be afraid or too proud to leverage things that are out there, okay? This, this world's getting more difficult every single day. Don't let your pride be what drowns you in it. Ex-Australian politician accused of helping international spies was recruited while serving in parliament. What? This is reported today? Oh. So, like I said, just like the last story, just because this is in Australia doesn't mean it's only in Australia. This is happening in the U.S. right now, I guarantee you 100%. But let's just take a little example from what happened in Australia, Okay. A former politician accused of helping an international spy ring was recruited while serving as a member of an Australian parliament. The boss of Australia's domestic intelligence organization revealed last week that a foreign spy group dubbed the A-Team had cultivated and recruited a now former politician. I pity the fool. Initially, the director general of the Australian security intelligence organization, Mike Burgess, provided no information about the person's age, gender, or political affiliation. However, he has since confirmed that although the person is no longer a politician, they were recruited while they were serving as a member of parliament. The matter is resolved, but this happened when they were a politician, he told SBS News. I won't comment on which parliament it was. What I will say is foreign interference against the political system happens at all levels of government, 
local, state, and federal, and applies itself equally across all political parties. Let me read that one more time, okay? Because this is really important for you guys to, to absorb, all right? I won't comment on which parliament it was. What I will say is foreign interference against the political system happens at all levels of government, local, state, and federal, and applies itself equally across all political parties, okay? Please keep that in mind as we move forward in this very unknown territory we're currently in when it comes to geopolitics. Someone is compromised somewhere. It doesn't matter if they're a Republican, a Democrat, if they are on your city council, or if they are on your state senate, whatever it is. They're trying their best to get into anything they can. And in fact, China has been really effective at getting involved in local politics, and that should definitely concern you. Because that's where they can have the most effect on your life directly. Okay, So all it comes down to is this person was spying for China while serving on parliament Okay, in Australia. So we know it's happening here. But to me, the big takeaway from that article was the fact that they wanted to emphasize this can happen at any level of government through any political party. All right. And we do have a little bit of a, a let's just call it a, uh, a bonus guest on the show today. China's best friend or little brother. I'm not sure how they refer to themselves anymore. North Korea, doing North Korea stuff. North Korean factories making arms for Russia are operating at full capacity, South Korea says. Why are they doing that? What are they prepping for? Just to make money? That's what a lot of people will have you believe. Okay. North Korea's munitions factories are operating at full capacity to produce weapons and shells for Russia, according to South Korea's defense minister, as Moscow's devastating war in Ukraine grinds into a third year. Real quick, I just want to say, if I didn't want someone to think I was going to go to war with them, but I knew they were going to find out I was mass producing weaponry at full capacity, I would maybe just make sure they thought I was selling it to someone else. Right. <laughs> what are you what are you doing all that for? Uh, it's so I can sell it to Russia. Oh, OK. Makes more sense. Yeah, 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 yeah. What? Why would I need all these guns? You know, why would I, why would I need all this ammo? Anyway, the latest estimate from South Korea offers fresh clues on the crucial but highly secretive role North Korea is playing to help res resupply Moscow's war of attrition at a time when Ukraine's own need for vital military resupplies is being held up by a predominantly Republican lawmakers in Congress. Uh, this is CNN. What do you expect, right? The weapons and military equipment, which include millions of rounds of artillery shells, is being delivered to Russia in exchange for shipments of food and other necessities. South Korean Defense Minister Shin Won-sik said Monday. Since August, Pyongyang has shipped about 6,700 containers to Russia, which could accommodate more than 3 million rounds of 152mm artillery shells, or more than 500,000 rounds of 122 millimeter multiple rocket launchers, according to Shin's ministry. While North Korea's arms factories for non-Russian exports operate at 30% capacity due to shortages of raw materials and electricity, the factories producing weapons and artillery shells for Russia are operating at full capacity, Shin said in a meeting with reporters. In exchange, food accounts for the largest po portion of the containers from Russia to North Korea and the food supply situation in the isolated Asian nation seems to be stable, according to the defense ministry. In a fact sheet released Friday, the U.S. State Department said North Korea has delivered more than 10,000 containers of munitions or related materials to Russia since September. Okay. So I just wanted to kind of touch on that to remind you that North Korea is still in the game. North Korea is producing munitions for Russia and uh, North Korea is a proxy of China, let's be honest. So because of that, um, there's just that much more production occurring. China's stockpiling everything. I don't know what else to say. They are. And it is problematic because at some point in time, you usually plan on using what you stockpile. Um, now, as preppers, maybe not so much. I think we all prefer to not have to use our stockpiles. But um, we have them just in case. But when militaries and governments start stockpiling, there's usually a reason behind it. And keep in mind, they have to maintain a budget 
or they're supposed to anyway, <laughs> not here in the US. We don't do that here, but you know what I'm saying? They have a budget to work with. So stockpiling is a decision that's made, right? It's not just a accident of surplus because even here in the US, when there's surplus, they generally sell it off, right? To recuperate some of those losses. But uh, it looks to me like China's getting ready for war. It's, I mean, it's just right there for you. If you don't connect all those dots and you just read those stories all separately, you might not feel that way as much, right? Oh, they're stockpiling chip components. Well, you know, they're expecting export restrictions, so it makes sense. They want to keep making microchips, so they just had they got to do that. Okay, yeah, makes sense, right? Oh, yeah, they're stockpiling grain because, you know, maybe they'll have a bad harvest. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it, apparently they actually had a surplus, but uh, and they're still importing more. But, yeah, I mean, I, I guess, you know, if they have a bad year, and then, now they've got some grain, right? Um, oh, yeah, nuclear weapons because... Um, can never have enough nuclear weapons, right? So you see what I'm, I'm saying. Like they're, they're, they're stockpiling and there's more than just a coincidence behind it. So I think that's going to be it for tonight. If you want to be in the private live stream, which will be happening right after this one, uh, you can join here on YouTube to be a channel member and you can hit that join button right below me or you can join Subscribestar, which I just put in the chat. I put exclusive content up over there from time to time. Sometimes I have preparedness incentives, which I have one coming out here soon, but I've just been working on acquiring the stuff for it. Uh, and every so often, I just like to say thank you to one of the Subscribestar members uh, by sending them something uh, related to preparedness. And then um, I also, um, you know, just have the YouTube channel memberships as well for these private chats. There's nothing in those chats that is... Um, imperative right so it's a casual conversation format we just hang out it's my way of saying thank you to those who want to support the channel directly but i'm never gonna put anything important behind a paywall so i just want everyone to be aware of that like anything that i find relevant or important to your preparedness it's going to be put on youtube so you can just watch it i'm not trying to uh you know gatekeep anything from you but i really appreciate every single one of you uh make sure you hit that thumbs up make sure you like the video and share it and also subscribe and all the things that i'm supposed to say that i am very bad at doing so <laughs> but private live stream starts at 9 45 central standard time so in about 10 minutes anything else at all you need from me go to magicpepper.com chat thank you all so much you're amazing tonight uh the smoke says there's lots of nudity in the private live stream well i guess you'll just have to join and come find out if that's the case or not but either way <laughs> that's gonna be it for Magic Prepper.